Hey, where are you? I asked my husband, who replied with a surprising statement. I'm on a trip with my folks. What? It's our daughter's birthday. What are you, crazy? Being a good son is more important, you know. Ah,、uh, I see. In that case, let me do what I want as well. I hung up the phone and got to work immediately. Hey, what's this about? He was frantic. It was his own doing. I wanted him to suffer. I'm Paige, a 34-year-old social worker. I've been married to Cooper for eight years now. We were originally co-workers in the same office. He was one of my bosses and even served as my mentor, so we naturally grew close. We started seeing each other outside of work, and got married after about a year. Our newlywed life was filled with love and happiness. It wasn't without its problems, though. The main issue was my in-laws. His parents wanted us to move in with them right after we got married, using their old age as an excuse. I adamantly refused, or rather, despised the idea with all my heart. I wanted to spend the first few years alone with Cooper, and there were other reasons as well. One of them was that I had an apartment of my own. My father is into real estate investment and owns several properties. When I got engaged, he gave me one of them as a wedding gift. It was built only three years ago, and it was fairly new, spacious, and very comfortable to live in. It was perfect for us as a couple, and there was plenty of space even if we had kids. So I had only thought about leaving there after marriage. I firmly expressed my opinion to Cooper. He was caught between his parents and me, but eventually he sided with me. When starting married life, my wife comes first, obviously. I also want to enjoy being just the two of us, so they should respect our wishes. I was happy when he was on board. From then on, my in-laws started making snide remarks to me whenever we met. You just don't want to live with old people like us, do you? You probably think we'd be a bother. What a heartless daughter-in-law you are! They held me responsible. Mom, Dad, don't blame her. The decision was mutual between us. Besides. Let us enjoy our honeymoon period alone. At first, Cooper stood up for me like that, but they didn't easily back down. They persistently complained and continued to talk badly about me. At some point, Cooper got tired of it too, and stopped defending me. Even when they said hurtful things about me, he pretended not to hear. Every time I saw them. I felt nothing, but unpleasant. Then I gave birth a year after we got married. It was a baby girl, and my in-laws again heavily blamed me for not having a male heir. Why didn't you have a boy? It's my eldest son's child, you know. If you had any common sense, you'd have a boy. We all know that with natural fertilization, we can choose the gender. I was left speechless by their irrational remarks. I couldn't believe they were being so selfish. But Cooper, despite them saying such unreasonable things, didn't stand up for me. I was very much disappointed about it, and after returning home, I complained to him. Hey. Why didn't you stand up for me when your parents were being so unreasonable? You're the only one who can stop their rampage. He looked dismayed hearing me say that. Well, maybe you should have just agreed to live with them in the first place. What? Because you refused. They took offense, and that's why you're getting this treatment. It's your own doing. Whoa! How can you say that to me? 
you were in agreement back then. And you even told them it was our mutual decision. I never thought that would be so persistent, you know. But it's undoubtedly your fault for continuously making them angry. Why don't you offer to live with them now? No freaking way. Our daughter was just born. Then stop complaining. Just accept whatever they say. Jeez. I was disappointed by his indifferent attitude. It cast doubt over our marriage for the first time. Well, I'd come to regret it in the end, but at that time, Kiara had just been born and it was difficult to contemplate divorce. From then on, I focused on taking care of Kiara. I had taken maternity leave so that I spent a lot of time with my daughter every day, bonding with her. Her smiles were genuinely adorable and heartwarming. I thought over and over that I would protect her for the rest of my life. I was just so smitten and in awe of her. Cooper also adored and dotted on her. You're so adorable. Don't grow up too fast. He seemed to enjoy playing with her. During that time of bonding with our daughter, our relationship as a couple was not as strained. It felt like we were connecting through her. As she grew and started speaking, she became even cuter. Mama, Dada. Oh, that's amazing. You can call us now. We were so over the top happy that you could probably call us dotting parents. Looking back, this might have been the happiest time. My in-laws had no interest in their granddaughter since she was a girl. So, I used childcare as a reason to stay away from them. That way, I avoided unnecessary stress. We went out to different places on weekend and created lots of fun memories. My phone was overloaded with image of Kiara. Just looking back at them filled my heart with love. As she grew, Cooper began to change little by little. The trigger was his job getting busier, and he started coming home late. Right after we got married, he changed jobs and moved to a different company. After a few years, he was promoted to manager and suddenly became very busy. It was a positive development at first. We had Kiara, and having a higher salary made life easier. It made saving for the future education much more manageable, and we didn't have to restrict her financially if she had things she wanted to do. However, the workload turned out to be more intense than we expected, and he always looked exhausted. He took on additional responsibilities and did overtime every day, so his mind and body didn't seem to get a chance to rest. Are you okay? Yeah, I'll manage. He came home looking drained and had no energy. Plus, he returned too late at night so he couldn't see Kiara. It was quite tough for him. I wanted to support him as much as I could, but I took over all the household chores and childcare. I also paid attention to what he ate, making sure to include nutritious options. Is daddy coming home late again? Seems like it. You want to go ahead and eat? Yeah. Kiara was sad that her dad was coming home late. She was getting bummed out about the decreasing opportunities to have dinner together. He was working hard for our sake, so I couldn't blame him. Daddy's working really hard to make sure you can do all the things you love, you know? The fact that we can eat this dinner right now is all thanks to him. So let's be super nice to daddy, okay? I'm going to write a card to daddy. She wrote short sentences on a piece of paper and folded it in half, which she expected him to read when he got home. In it, she wrote, Thank you for working hard, daddy. I love you. 
I knew he would probably tear up when he read it. I wrapped up the dinner and placed it on the table with the card. Since he normally didn't return until around midnight, both Kiara and I went to bed before that. The next morning, the card had been collected, and Cooper woke up looking happy. Did you get the card? Yeah, she's such a sweet kid. It lifted my spirits. Well, glad to hear. Don't push yourself too hard, honey. Yeah, I know. He said that. But either due to his sense of responsibility or else, he couldn't reduce his overtime, and late nights continued. He looked tired every day, and even when I tried to talk to him, he seemed out of space. He was also working on weekends, which left him exhausted, and he'd spend Sundays sleeping. We couldn't go on family outgoings, but I also couldn't blame him. In the midst of this. Something bad happened. He finally collapsed at work. I received a call from the hospital and rushed over. Oh my God, honey! Oh, I'm sorry to freak you out. I pushed myself too hard. It seems. I mean, this much. Jeez, if something happened to you and you were gone, we couldn't bear it. Sorry. But the company finally realized that they put too much pressure on me. They've decided to eliminate overtime from now on. There were other people who got sick or experienced mental breakdowns because of the workload. They decided to make fundamental changes. That's good news, Daddy. Kiara, I'm sorry for making you worry. Cooper lifted her up to his bed and held her in his arms. She looked happy as he affectionately stroked her back. From now on, I'll work without overdoing it. That's a promise. He wasn't suffering from an illness, and it was simply due to exhaustion. After a few days of observation, including test and treatment, he was said to be discharged. I felt relief upon hearing that. Over the next few days, I took some time off to take care of him in the hospital. Honey, you don't need to come here every day. No way! I'm too worried. Here's a change of clothes. I'll put the pudding in the fridge, okay? Oh, thanks. When you're discharged, let's go out for some good food. Yeah, sounds good. We were enjoying our conversation when my in-laws arrived. Cooper, oh God, are you okay? We heard you collapsed from overwork. Oh, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry for making you worry. They immediately turned to glare at me. You, Paige, how can you drive him to the point of collapsing from overwork? Excuse me. You forced him to work so hard, and even made him to do housework, didn't you? You're a terrible woman. I was taken aback by their sudden accusation. Hey, both of you, don't jump to conclusions. I collapsed because my company was giving me too many responsibilities. She was actually worried about me. Even if that's the case, we don't want her around when we are here. I had no choice but to obey. All right, I'm leaving then. Good riddance. I was extremely upset, but they were still his parents, and I had to step back. I didn't want to have a fight in the hospital anyway. I reduced my frequency of visiting since he'd be discharged soon, and his parents were visiting frequently. About a week later, he came back home. Welcome back, Daddy. Oh, I missed you, Kiara. We'll come home. Thanks for everything, honey. We were thrilled to have him back, and celebrated the occasion by going out to a restaurant. It had been a while since the three of us had dinner together, and Kiara was beaming with smiles. Afterward, 
Cooper was able to finish work on time and return home early. Kiara was delighted that he could have dinner with her. She enthusiastically talked about her daily school experiences. Watching her face brighten up, I was filled with happiness. It was wonderful to spend time as a family at last. After a while, Cooper started to come home late again, although not as late as before, but often around 10 p.m. He also had to work on weekends more often, which made me worry. Hey, honey, are you okay? Is your workload increasing again? Oh, I'm fine. It's not as bad as before, and I'm not as tired as you might think. All right, if you say so. The opportunities to have dinner together decreased again, which made Kiara sad. Then, when her birthday arrived, a problem arose. Will Daddy come home early today? Of course he will. You guys make the promise this morning, right? So let's prepare a feast and wait for him. Okay. I left work early to get ready. I bought a cake and made all of her favorite dishes, so everything was perfect. We eagerly awaited his return, but he didn't show up even after 8 p.m. Is Daddy coming back soon? Yeah, I'm sure he's already nearby. I sent multiple messages, but they remained unread. I was getting worried. By the time I noticed, it was past 9 p.m. The food was getting cold. Kiara's face grew more and more gloomy. Unable to hold back my frustration, I called him incessantly. I was determined to get through to him. He finally answered after several tries. At last, aren't you done with work yet? You know it's Kira's birthday today, right? Yeah, sorry. I heard a lot of commotion in the background. It was definitely not his workplace. I could hear music and chattering. Hey, where are you?、Uh, obviously, I'm at work. That's a lie. What's all that noise in the background? You're definitely not in the office. I knew something was amiss, but I never expected to hear what he said next. Um, I'm on a trip with my folks right now. What? We had planned this a while ago. Hold on. How come you're telling me this now? It's our daughter's birthday, you know. You're supposed to be celebrating with her tonight. You made a promise, right? You said this morning that you'd come home early, didn't you? But but being a good son is more important, you know. What? The... Anyway, it's all your fault. I'm stuck in the middle because you can't get along with my parents, and I have to choose between you. Oh, I see. In that case, I will do what I want to. His outburst shattered something within me. I hung up the phone and got to work immediately. Then something I never expected came to light. Filled by anger, I decided to bring judgment day upon him. Hey, sweetie, it looks like Daddy can come home soon. We'll have a birthday party with just two of us, okay? I started reheating the food. She was almost to tears, but she must have sensed something from me. Instead of crying, she quietly went along with me. After that, I called my father. He introduced me to his trusted real estate agent, and we quickly put the apartment on the market. Kiara and I moved our belongings to another property owned by my father, and Cooper's stuff was sent to his parents. By acting swiftly, I managed to complete the move in no time. A few days later, Cooper called me frantically. "What's up, Cooper? Hey, what happened here?" He sounded freaked out. "Why isn't my key working?" "Because that apartment's on sale now." "On sale? What the heck are you doing?" "Well, you missed Kira's birthday." 
Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But is that enough reason to take such drastic action? You're right. I'm not doing it just because of that. What's really pissing me off is that you told so many lies. You lied about taking a trip with your parents, right? W what are you talking about? I did go with them. You know, I called your mom after I spoke to you. Oh, I wanted to give her a piece of my mind. But she said she hadn't left anywhere and was still at home. At first, I thought she was lying. But when I explained the situation, she came over. That's when I found out you used them to make up a lie. So, who did you go on the trip with? Um, well, I I'm sorry, I was cheating. I knew it. You chose the trip with your mistress over your own daughter's birthday. It was planned a while ago. I didn't realize that it clashed with her birthday until recently. I didn't know what to do. You are the worst father. You think it's obvious which one should take priority, right? Anyway, we're getting a divorce. No. Of course, yes. Does it mean I won't be able to see Kira anymore? That's up to you. Reflect on the fact that what you did was terrible, and let's handle the rest through lawyers. I hung up on him. Afterward, he went back to his parents' house, where he received a severe scolding from them and was subsequently kicked out. I then filed a divorce through a lawyer and requested alimony and child support. I managed to claim $60,000 just for alimony. As it turns out, his mistress was a nurse at a hospital where he stayed. They had continued their affair after he was discharged. I submitted a bad review, advising people to be aware that there was a husband snatching nurse working there. It attracted a lot of attention, and the hospital HR eventually contacted me to investigate. Subsequently, she was let go. She and Cooper broke up, and he now lives a solitary and financially strained life working hard to pay off the alimony and child support. After all, it's all his own doing. Let him suffer, for all I care. On the other hand, I decided to move in with my parents until Kiara was a little older. I'm working diligently so that even as a single parent household, we won't be pitied by others. I'm going to cherish my daughter and lead a fulfilling life from now on. Currently, we're at my husband's boss's wedding. The celebration is full swing, and my husband's had a bit too much to drink. When his boss mentioned his bride's homemaking skills, my husband said, My wife can't cook, and she never cleans up. I couldn't believe he'd make fun of me like that, especially with me right there. I shot back. Should you really be critiquing your wife's housekeeping skills when you're lying about business trips to stay at your mistress's place? He looked totally shocked, and his boss just gave a confused, huh? This is just the tip of the iceberg for my revenge. I'm Vicky, 32 years old. I'm a freelance certified public accountant and work remotely from home. My job as a CPA involves managing financial information, producing reports, and auditing. In simpler terms, I'm self-employed and provide financial services to my clients. I married my now husband, an office worker, three years ago after a friend introduced us. I was instantly attracted to his outgoing and friendly nature. It wasn't like me, but I went out of my way to get his attention. Fast forward, and two years ago, we welcomed our daughter, Amy, into our lives. While I'd love to say everything's been a fairy tale, since getting married, I've noticed Arthur tends to slack once he feels he's secured something. He does his job, pays his bills, and isn't aggressive or mean. 
but he doesn't lift a finger at home, dumping all domestic and childcare duties on me, claiming, That's a woman's job, right? I'm working hard out there, so quit nagging. What century is he from? I'm not asking for him to take over everything, just some support when I'm swamped. He assumes my days are a breeze. He thinks I'm lounging around, working when I feel like it. He even once quipped about my setup. It must be sweet staying at home all day. I've got piles of work, a boss to please, and clients to deal with. You wouldn't get it. Even though I'm at home, he expects me to handle all the chores. I fired back. Hold on a sec. I am working from home. Juggling that with Amy is not easy. He responded. Really? Looks to me like you're just goofing off on the computer. Wish I could work from home and take it easy without anyone seeing. He said it with a smile. I don't think he meant any harm, but it did irk me how he downplayed my work. On the bright side, he occasionally takes Amy to the park, and they play together sometimes on weekends. He always makes it a point to be home for special days like birthdays or Christmas, showering Amy and me with gifts. We've had our share of good times. That's why I've been keeping my frustrations to myself. I mean, maybe this is just how relationships are. No one's perfect, and compromise is part of the deal. I don't want to split from him. I take pride in how efficiently I juggle my remote job, house chores, and taking care of Amy. We had a system that kind of worked. But recently, his behavior has been off. He used to be a homebody on weekends, either buried in his comics or playing games. Lately, he's rarely home, often saying, I'm heading out. Don't bother with dinner for me, before heading out the door. He doesn't just disappear from home on weekends. He's also often working overtime during the week. Sometimes, he even says he has to pull an all-nighter at work and then returns the next morning. It's strange that it happens so often throughout the month, instead of just once or twice. This got me worried, so I confronted him about it one day. Hey, it feels like you've been coming back home in the mornings a lot. Plus, you're always gone on weekends. How about we spend some quality time together as a family? But his response was harsh. How can you give your husband grief when he's busting his butt for this family? I'm killing myself out here, working for us. He gave me a fierce look. But being the kind of person I am, I didn't look away. So, where are you always heading off to? At least tell me that. I'm not telling you to stay home, I just want to be in the loop. I've been hanging out at my boss, Carlos's house. His fiancé loves hosting parties all the time, and since I report to him, I get invited a lot. I'm familiar with Carlos, with Matt. I've even attended one of his extravagant house parties. Carlos's fiancé, Sarah, was a model back in the day, and it's drop-dead gorgeous. Word is, they are living together and planning to get married. Sarah's my age, 32, but she could pass for someone in her early 20s. She's got fair, almost glowing skin and large eyes, rosy lips and vibrant apple-colored cheeks. She's slender with a graceful frame. Even seeing her as another woman, I had to admit, she was a knockout. But personality-wise, she left a lot to be desired. Sarah, I remember the first time I went to their house party and she walked up to me. That's a memory I wish I could shake, but can't. You're Vicky, right? Heard your cooking isn't that great. Sarah remarked with a sly smile. Her comment caught me off guard and I responded, Who told you that? 
Arthur was venting about it, said he dressed dinner time because of the bad food. Her words left me reeling. The idea of Arthur badmouthing me to others was inconceivable. She went on, "It's okay, you know. Everyone's got something they're not great at, and just because you think your meals are tasty doesn't mean your husband agrees. Guess you have to step up your cooking game." On the face of it, you'd think she was trying to be supportive, but she had this laugh, like she was getting a kick out of it. What a mean lady! I thought. Who directly shares a husband's gripes with his wife? Carlos really picked a winner with her. I mumbled sarcastically to myself. Another thought crossed my mind, though. Even if they were tight, would Arthur really talk about our home life to his boss's fiance? I was about to get answers to my doubts in the worst way imaginable. It all unraveled on Amy's second birthday. I was hustling to get the room ready and the cake set up. I decided to throw a birthday bash in our large living room to make it special. Amy was taking a nap in our bedroom. The plan was to surprise her when she woke up. Arthur was pitching in, especially with the high up decorations. But then his phone rang. He glanced at the number and seemed to hesitate. Intrigued, I probed. "What's up? If it's a call, just answer it here." "No, it's work. I'd rather not mix business with family time. There might be sensitive info." With that, he exited the room. He was gone for a good half hour, deeply engrossed in his chat. When he finally came back, he looked really shaken. Out of nowhere, he raised his voice at me. I got called into work. I'm heading to the office now. Out of nowhere, I was caught off guard and tried to hold him back. Hold on, are you really going to work now? Today is Amy's birthday. He brushed past me, giving me a frustrated look. Get the picture. There are bigger things at play here. Don't hold me up. With that, he bolted out the door. I was stunned by his abrupt reaction. His words kept replaying in my mind. How could he downplay our precious Amy's birthday like that? Why would he be so thoughtless? He told me he took the day off for this. What work emergency could be more pressing than Amy's day? I decided to peek in on the sleeping girl. She looked so serene. It would break her heart to learn her dad missed her birthday when she wakes up. Not knowing how to process everything, my mind was spinning. But then it hit me. I checked something in the kids' room and was horrified by my find. Anger welled up inside me. Aha!、Uh-huh. So that's what's been happening. That's the real reason he dashed out. I won't forgive him for this. The next day, Arthur came home like nothing happened. Flashing a grin, he said, "Sorry about yesterday." I replied with a smile, "It's all right." But inside, I was plotting my next move. After a while, he filled me in about Carlos and Sarah's upcoming wedding. Turns out she was expecting, so they sped up their wedding plans. We got an invite. And I had my own plans for their big day. Everything was going off without a hatch at the wedding. Arthur was living it up, sipping enough to get rosy cheeks. As I nibbled my food, I kept an eye on him. Just then, the couple of the hour, Carlos and Sarah walked over. Sarah, in her stunning wedding gown, turned heads left and right. All the men there couldn't get their eyes off the princess. Smiling wide, Arthur patted Carlos on the back. Carlos, congrats! Then he asked Carlos, "What's your favorite thing about Sarah?" A bit shy, he answered, "Her cooking, I think." Chuckling, he added, "That's totally not like my wife. She struggles with house stuff." 
bad cook, not the best cleaner, wished she could pick up a few tips from Sarah. It was pretty gutsy of him to diss his wife with her right there. Sarah let out a laugh at his comment, while Carlos smirked and said, You shouldn't talk bad about your wife like that. He cautioned Arthur. Seeing my moment, I jumped in. Bad cooking and cleaning? How would you know? When you're always out on fake business trip, sneaking off to your mistress's place. Both Sarah and Arthur looked surprised at my words, while Carlos blurted out a confused, What? Pushing forward, I said to him, Carlos, you were out of the country for a month recently, right? Oddly enough, my husband was gone at the same time. Are you connecting the dots? At first baffled, realization dawned on his face. Wait, what are you hinting at? He asked, his voice shaking a bit. Keeping my cool, I spelled it out. It's pretty simple. Arthur was at your place the whole time, just him and Sarah. Carlos's eyes widened in shock, darting between Arthur and Sarah. My husband seemed rattled, and Sarah shot me a piercing look, biting her lip. Really? Don't throw around baseless claims. I'll take you to court for slander. Boosted by Sarah's feisty response, Arthur also began to berate me. Exactly. You think you can frame me like this? Just because you got wind of some gossip, you're pulling this ugly trick? That's low. Say you're sorry to me and Sarah, now. I let their outburst roll off me, pulling out my phone and hitting play on a video. Loud and clear, the footage displayed my husband in our kids room on a call with Sarah. Sarah, you're expecting? Whose baby is it? Wait, mine? His flustered voice followed. Carlos's expression tightened, signaling a game-changing moment. The video kept rolling. I was with you the whole month Carlos was traveling. What should we do? Neither of us wants to split from our partners, right? And then the kicker. Okay, we'll fast-track the wedding and the kid will be known as Carlos's. Best that way. If my wife finds out, it'll be a nightmare. Just keep it between us. We gotta figure out as soon as possible. The clip wrapped up. Since I played it so loudly, everyone around us was all ears, setting a scene abuzz. A nanny cam in the little one's room had caught the whole thing. I got it because our toddler, Amy, is a little firecracker and prone to getting into mischief. I kept quiet about the camera, anticipating Arthur would grumble, going, Total waste of cash. We don't need it. So, clueless about the camera, he chose the kid's room for the risky call with Sarah. What followed was sheer pandemonium, with Carlos absolutely fuming. Sarah, what is this about? You said it was my baby. Were you playing me all along? And you, Arthur, after everything I've done for you, you chase my fiancé? Sarah started crying. I'm so sorry. I lost myself. Please, just calm down. Arthur scrambled for words. I can't apologize enough. Hear me out, there's a reason behind it. The scene was bedlam. Needless to say, the wedding was off. We'll hash this out later, Carlos muttered to me, lowering his gaze. With eyes blazing, Carlos escorted a weeping Sarah out, followed by both of their families. She was in for a storm from both sides. What remained was a mix of bewildered guests, me, and shell-shocked Arthur. You planning on hanging around like a statue? I said, and he snapped. What did you just unleash, making a scene like that? 
crying thou? All because you hooked up with your boss's girl, and she's expecting, no less. Stumped by my response, he glanced downward, then hit me with puppy dog eyes. You're not thinking about a divorce, are you? With all the dust settled, you've got to feel better. Amy needs both her parents. Sarah and I are done. We get a redo, right? More than ire, I was taken aback by his brazen plea. Did he honestly think we could just hit the reset button after all of that? The real reason he doesn't want to split is because Carlos is on to him about the affair. From the get-go, Arthur hasn't been making a lot of money, and after this mess, his job's probably on the line. If I go after him for alimony, his life's definitely taking a nosedive. That's his main reason for dodging a divorce. How self-absorbed is that? I let him have it. Cut the crap! We're getting divorced! There's no walking this back. I'll be coming for compensation from both you and Sarah. Plus, I want child support. Get ready. Hearing this, he just lost it. Tears and all. Please, don't go there. I'm really begging you here. My pay isn't great, and I swear I'm done straying. I'll do whatever you say from here out. I seriously messed up. Just think about the divorce. Why would I believe a word from you? You even spaced on Amy's birthday. A loser like you around isn't good for my daughter. Just steer clear of us. Please. I brushed off his last-ditch efforts and split from the place alone. Down the line, Arthur and I went our separate ways, and Carlos and Sarah called off their wedding. I got compensation and child support out of Arthur, and naturally a chunk from Sarah too. He had to bow out of his job, given the whole boss's fiancé turned baby mama situation. They ended up in debt, shelling out for Carlos's demands. Word is, Arthur and Sarah got married because of the baby, but they are living in the red, dodging bill collectors. Frankly, I am unfazed hearing about it. They reaped what they sowed. As for me, I got custody of Amy and headed back to my folks' place. Amy's been the apple of her grandparents' eyes, and she's thriving. I've been living peacefully, shaking off all the Arthur drama. Going in alone with Amy, I'm all about keeping it positive. My husband's job keeps him on the road a lot, so we didn't have much family time. But he's super committed to his work, and I've always admired that and rolled with it. Then, out of the blue, he gave me a call. When I answered, he sounded all mixed up, saying, Something's up with our front door. My key's not working. Without missing a beat, I said, Oh, I moved out yesterday. I shipped your stuff over to your parents' house. What? I could practically hear his jaw drop over the line. Hold on. Why would you do this without giving me a heads up? I started explaining. It's because you... Upon hearing my story, his voice went colder than I'd ever heard. I'm Rachel, 33 years old. I'm a nurse, hustling every day. It's just me, my husband Josh, and our little girl Karen at home in our apartment. Josh and I, we go way back from our college days. He was the guy everyone noticed. Super driven, always on his game, and a total catch. I sometimes wonder how a regular girl like me snagged him. We stayed strong post-college, and fast forward, he popped the question, and we got married five years back. Karen popped into our lives the following year. Our daily life is a pretty smooth sailing, with barely any squabbles. To an outsider, we probably look like a dream team. But there is a little wrinkle. 
Josh runs this small company and is all in. He works late nights. He even slept at the office when things were hectic. He does remember to send gifts for birthday or Christmas, but he's never there for actual moments. He's flaked on us a bunch because works pulled him away. I get his work's intense, so I try not to sweat the small stuff. But it tugs at my heartstrings when Karen says, "I guess Daddy's not coming back home tonight." And here's the kicker: for the crazy hour he works, his paycheck's kind of light. We are not scraping by or anything, but I foot most of our bills. He did once say, "Look, business is tough right now with the economy and all. I hate dumping everything on you. I really do." I told him, "No need to feel bad. I'm just worried about you burning out." Trust me, I'm tougher than I look. Stick with me a bit longer. Once things level out, you can ditch that grueling nurse job. He seemed genuinely remorseful, and honestly, that made me second guess my concerns. I figured maybe I'm being too hard on him with the money thing. I chose to back him up even more, but then something went down that rocked my world. That particular day was total mayhem at the hospital, with emergency left and right. Doctors were on edge, and us nurses were hustling nonstop. Being the newbie, I was still trying to fit in. Just when you think things couldn't get crazier, a bunch of critically injured patients rolled in. Among them was this toddler, maybe two, out cold after a car accident. His probable mom was with him, looking white as sheet. Over and over, she pleaded, "Stay with me, Dan." My heart just broke, thinking of my own kid. All I could do was hope and pray for him. The ER was buzzing, and I was right there, assisting in surgery. Every medical professional at the scene was giving it their all to save this little kid's life. A few hours in, we successfully wrapped up the surgery. I headed over to the family waiting area to update them on the boy's condition. As I got closer, I was riding high on relief that the little guy was okay, but I wasn't ready for what came next. As I neared the room, I overheard the woman chatting with a guy, likely her husband. I was about to jump in and update them. When I saw the guy she was with, hold on, was that? Yep, there he was, my husband, Josh. I'd recognize him anywhere, and he was even wearing the suit I picked out for his business trips. Eavesdropping a bit, his voice was unmistakable. The call about Dan's accident nearly gave me a heart attack. Thank goodness he's all right. I'm sorry. I just looked away for a second, and then he was in the street. Hey, I've been gone a lot, leaving you to do the heavy lifting with parenting. I can't put this on you. Let's just be grateful he's okay. He then pulled her into a hug. My brain was an overdrive. What the heck was happening? Why was Josh there? Did he just say parenting? Does that mean? As much as I didn't want to think it, the pieces seemed to fit one way. Josh had another life I didn't know about. After that surprise, I was a mess at work, slipping up left and right, which wasn't my style. The head nurse didn't let it slide. I took her critique. I mean, she was right, but I could tell she was worried. Rachel, you're off today. What's up? Taking a deep breath, I told her. She offered to do a little digging for me and suggested I go home for the day. My head wasn't in the game at home either, and just as I was piecing things together, Josh called. Hey, everything's okay there? Playing it cool, I responded. He came back with, "Look." 
something's come up with my trip. I'll be away another week. Can you hold down the fort with Karen? The nerve of him! But I didn't want to tip him off without more info, so I played along. Got it. Do what you've got to do. Just stay safe, okay? He sounded genuinely thankful, saying, "I owe you one." After we hung up, I gave myself a little pep talk. I didn't want to believe the worst, but I couldn't just brush this off. For me and Karen, I needed answers. It was go time. Come next morning, the head nurse had a scoop. Turns out she's gotten close with the boy's mom, Jennifer. Jennifer works at a bar, and that's where she ran into Josh. He made the first move. They hit it off, and before long, they were married. Especially after she got pregnant. And according to the head nurse, Jennifer is clueless about Josh's other life. I thanked her for the information. Seriously, thank you for this. Sorry to drag you into my drama. I've got it from here. She said, "Any time you need to chat, I'm here. I am lucky to have a great boss like her." Wanting to talk to Jennifer, I popped into the boy's room and saw her right there, constantly attending to him. She was comforting the kid who was restless and unable to get up. "It's okay. When you're all better, we'll go out and play." Even though she's involved with my husband, she's a mom first. Seeing her like that, I just couldn't blame her. I get the whole mom thing. When I had a break, I went up to her. Hi there. It's great to see your son getting better. Here's hoping he bounces back soon. Oh, Rachel, right? Thank you. I'm just so relieved he's okay. You look worn out. Make sure you're not pushing yourself too hard. How about taking a little break? I led her to the break room and decided to probe about Josh. Your husband's really there for you guys. I see him with your son daily. He's super involved. Her reply threw me for a loop. Well, he's often traveling for work as a photographer. Hold up, photographer. Did I ever see Josh with a camera? Wait, he. Did buy a high-end one for Karen's preschool event. He must have spun that into this photographer story. I felt dumb for buying his line about just wanting to snap pictures of our daughter. Turns out, according to Jennifer, he's got some debt, and once that's settled, they are getting officially married. While he griped about making less due to the economy, he was also bankrolling her family. No wonder his funds seemed stretched. He was fooling me. Here I was thinking I was helping him through tough times. It's not just me. Even Jennifer got played by him. I'll never let that slide. A week later, I get a call from Josh post his business trip. He sounded totally lost. Rachel, something's up with our front door. My key is not working. Think it's jammed. Can you let me in? Sorry, can't do that. We are not there. Hold up. Aren't you off today? Where'd you go? I shot back with. We moved out yesterday. I sent our stuff to my folks' place. Your things have been shipped to your parents. Best check in with them. He sounded blindsided. What? You left? Why on earth? I heard everything from Jennifer, juggling two families, huh? Explains the small paychecks. If you're supporting two households, of course you're broke. You're consistently inconsistent. Whoa! How did you find out about Jennifer? He sounded flat out frantic. Hello, I work at the hospital where your other kid had his surgery. It dawned on him his son landed in my workplace. I had told him I switched hospitals, but it must have slipped his mind. Figures with all his sneaking. 
cutting ties with someone like that. The sooner, the better. So, I ditched the house lease under my name and went back to my parents with my daughter. Once he pieced everything together, Josh was falling over himself to apologize. Give me a chance to explain. I'm at work right now. We'll handle this with our attorneys. With that, I ended the call. No point in hearing excuses over the phone. But then, to my surprise, he showed up at the hospital. Where is my wife? He yelled, causing a scene. Thankfully, the waiting room was empty at the time. I filled the head nurse in, took a breather, and we headed to a private room. Josh immediately started with his apologies. She kept coming on to me, and one thing led to another. But you're the one I truly love. I promise I will end it with her. Please forgive me. I couldn't believe he tried to pin this on Jennifer. How could he think of just ditching someone he'd been lying to? It's not as easy as just breaking up. You two have a kid. How do you plan on stepping up for that child? He looked desperate. That kid isn't mine. She's saying it is, but it's from her previous relationship. Suddenly, a voice rang out. What did you just say? Jennifer had been hiding behind the door and listening this whole time. Earlier, I told her straight up that I was his wife. At first, she didn't buy it. But our wedding photos and marriage certificate convinced her. She'd apologized profusely, even offered to compensate me. But honestly, I couldn't be mad at her. She was also blindsided by Josh's lies. My plan was to get evidence of their fling from her to use against Josh. Seeing her now, Josh went pale. She challenged him. Are you really saying Dan isn't yours? I've never been with anyone else. Want a paternity test to prove it? Josh couldn't meet her gaze, and she seemed to be telling the truth. Both of us gave him a hard stare. After an awkward silence, he came out with, I care about both of you. I want to support both families. Can't we just keep things as they are? Jennifer and I were floored by his audacity. As I was processing his nonsense, Jennifer beat me to the punch. Are you for real? Just now you denied Dan was yours. We're done, and trust me, I'll be getting child support from you. She stormed out, leaving Josh and me. I took a deep breath and said, I'm with her. After all this, you can't expect things to go back to normal. I truly feel for Jennifer and Dan being fooled by you. We are getting a divorce, and you better be ready to pay up. But, Rachel, please. I don't want to lose you or Karen. How can I trust a word you say? You just threw Jennifer and Dan under the bus. This will be handled by our attorneys. Leave, or I'm calling security. He walked out, tears streaming down his face. A month later, Josh and I were officially done. I got a one-time payment of $600,000 for the pain and suffering and another $300,000 for child support. Looks like Jennifer did too. Between that and losing focus at work, Josh's business tanked. Last I heard, he borrowed from some shady people and is now grinding away in a factory with some rough-looking supervisors. As for me and my daughter, we are staying with my folks, living a peaceful life. They dote on Karen, and she's thriving. Through all this, my main goal is to be there for my daughter and be the best mom I can be. It's been a month since our baby girl arrived. At a family gathering, out of the blue, my husband stood up and said something crazy. Hey everyone, I've got some news. Sadly, we are getting a divorce. 
Our parents and his sister were totally blindsided, and so was I. Hold on, what's this about? I burst out, clutching our baby, my voice shaking. He pointed right at me and said, "She's the reason. She's been seeing someone else behind my back." This came out of nowhere. His folks shot me a look of disbelief. Jumping to my defense, I shot back, "I've never cheated on you." With this smirky expression, my husband took out an envelope. I had my suspicions, so I got a DNA test for our baby. The results are right here. This baby isn't mine. She stepped out of our marriage, so we're done. The report he flashed read: parent-child relationship, not confirmed. Every set of eyes turned to me, their faces pale. I was at my wit's end. How could he do this to me in front of everyone? But I thought, I've got something for you. Just you wait. His big plan was about to blow up in his face. My name is Janet. I'm a 28-year-old working mom. After college, I got a job at my dream publishing house. They put me on their women's magazine team, and I gave it my all. Years went by, and it hit me. I hadn't dated anyone in over half a decade. Friends and colleagues nagged me to shake things up, so I tried out a speed dating event. That's where I met Simon, my future husband. Everyone wanted to talk with him that evening because he was tall and dressed sharp. But for some reason, after chatting with me, he liked me. We hit it off and exchanged numbers. Things took off from there, and after a year, he proposed to me. Janet, will you marry me? Let's make this last forever. Oh, Simon, this means everything. He was your typical office guy at a mid-sized company. Truth be told, my paycheck was bigger than his since I was with a big company. But hey, it didn't faze me. I felt we had the right stuff to make it work. Meeting my parents to talk marriage, they were all in. Over at Simon's place, his parents got all teary-eyed and gushed. Simon struck gold with you. We were totally on board with the wedding. Janet, look out for Simon, okay? His sister, who's big into sports and teaches PE, cracked up and said, "My baby brother can be a handful, but you've got this." It felt great to see his family was so happy and supportive. Fast forward, Simon and I got married, and our journey as a married couple began. Married life was pretty good. I was putting in some serious hours at work, but Simon was on top of things at home. On weekends, we either hit the town or made something in the kitchen, just enjoying each other. And as you'd guess, with any new couple, things were sizzling in the romance department. A year of this. And something nice happened. I was expecting. Simon, I think we are pregnant. For real? That's amazing. Both our families were over the moon, and it was nothing but happiness all around. But then, morning sickness hit me like a freight train. It was like being stuck on a rocky boat all day long. With me getting sick, even when there was nothing left, I couldn't go to work. So I filled in my boss and decided to stay home until I felt better. Good thing my boss, who'd been through the whole baby thing herself, totally got it. But with me around the house more, Simon started getting a bit weird. So, you're handling things at home now, right? I've always thought housework was such a drag. Well, I would do my best, but this morning sickness is no joke. I need your support like before. What? You're not working or handling chores? Isn't that a bit much? His words caught me off guard. Don't you see? I'm pregnant with our child. It's not like I want to feel like this. I just wish you'd get it. Okay, okay. 
I hear you. But it feels like you're using the pregnancy as a free pass for everything. The way he brushed me off made me uneasy. From then on, while Simon did chores, if I nagged him, he didn't seem to care about how I was feeling and just kept on with his usual routine. In fact, he was even more vocal about his dislike for housework, and even with my rentless morning sickness, he still expected intimacy like nothing had changed. Hey, Janet, how about tonight? I can't. The morning sickness is killing me. All right, all right, got it. He turned away, clearly frustrated. I thought he'd be there for me during the pregnancy, but the reality was a real letdown. As days turned into weeks, and my morning sickness faded, Simon started coming home later and seemed more distant. He didn't check in on me much, and I felt more and more uneasy. But with everything I was going through, confronting him wasn't on my radar. Then, when I was nearly due, I saw something after a hospital visit that made my heart drop. Heading out to shop for baby stuff, I caught sight of Simon on a busy sidewalk. Right next to him was a young blonde woman, and they seemed close. Maybe it was a gut feeling. I couldn't shake the thought that they were more than friends. I lost them in the crowd, and my mood for shopping evaporated. I just headed home. Waiting for me was a text from Simon. Got held up at work again. Had he been distanced because of her? But the idea of him stepping out, especially with me being pregnant, seemed wild. Even though I was torn up inside, confronting him didn't feel right. Still, I couldn't ignore my doubts, so I dug into my pre marriage savings and hired a private eye to tell my husband. With my due date only two weeks away, time was ticking. Then, two days out from the due date, I felt the first labor pains. I timed them, about 20 minutes apart. I thought I was going into labor. So I quickly contacted Simon to let him know that it seemed like the contractions had started. When I called the hospital, they said to come in when they were 10 minutes apart. Terrified and in pain, I kept texting Simon, begging him to get home. But nothing. When the contractions got closer, I dialed his number. What do you want? He sounded irritated. I have been texting! I'm in labor. Can you take me to the hospital? Pushing through the pain, I shouted. His answer was unbelievable. Can't do it. Swamped with work. Grab a cab. Are you serious? Your wife is having a baby here. Sorry, but look, I will sing by the hospital later. Just hold on until then. He hung up, sounding totally nonchalant. With no other choice, I called a cab and let my folks know, heading off to the hospital. I'd been in labor for hours, but Simon was nowhere to be found at the hospital. My mom, who'd gotten there before him, tried to ease my pain by rubbing my back. I shifted painfully onto the delivery bed, and an hour later, through immense pain, our baby was born. Just as I heard her first cries, Simon walked in. She's here? Janet, I'm so sorry I missed it. The way he overdid his apology in front of my folks really got to me. But right after delivering, I was too wiped out to give him a piece of my mind. I watched, still feeling weak, as he acted all fatherly, holding our little girl. A couple of days later, Simon's family dropped by. Janet, you did amazing. How are you holding up? His mom asked, showing genuine concern. Why his sister gifted us something for the baby. His dad looked pretty proud, saying, Whoa, doesn't she look like Simon as a baby? Simon, though, looked conflicted. We named our baby girl Tina. After I was discharged, 
Simon drove us home, and I was met with a messy house, dirty clothes everywhere, and a sink full of dishes. Simon, why didn't you clean up? I bursted out, but all he did was shrug. Figured you'd handle it when you got back. I just had a baby, and I'm still healing, and I have to take care of her. He just looked annoyed and said, "Whatever, I'm out of here." On a Sunday? Where to? Work. I won't be back till late. He took off, leaving me stunned with Tina in my arms. His routine stayed the same. He would come home only to crash, never helping with Tina. I was on my own for everything: feeding, bathing, bedtime. A few days into this routine, I got a call from a detective with some info to share. Since I couldn't really get around, I asked her to come over. The evidence she showed me was shocking. How could he pull something like this during my pregnancy? That evening, I did something to the unsuspecting sleeping Simon. Luckily, he didn't notice a thing. A month after Tina's arrival. We threw a little get together. We got food and spruced up the living room a bit. Both our parents came over, totally taken by Tina. As we took some photos, our folks showered her with affection. Simon's sister showed up a bit late. Just as we were about to eat, Simon stood up. Hey everyone, I've got some news. Sadly, we are getting a divorce. Everyone. Including his sister was dumbfounded. So was I. Hold on, what's this about? I managed to ask, clutching Tina. Simon pointed right at me. She's the reason. She has been seeing someone else behind my back. My parents shot me a shocked look as he said this. I shot back immediately. I've never cheated on you. Grinning, he pulled out an envelope. I had my doubts, so I got a DNA test. This kid, she's not mine. She cheated, so we are splitting up. The report he waved around read: parent-child relationship denied. Everyone's eyes were on me, disbelief all around. That was it. Enough was enough. He wanted to play this game in front of our families. Come on. Jonet, is Tina really not Simon's? His dad asked, clearly upset. Come on, Jonet, be straight with us. My parents started, but I quickly pulled out the paper. Please, everyone, look here. This is a real DNA result for Simon and Tina, and there it was in black and white, a ninety-nine point nine 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 percent parent-child match. Everyone in the room was stunned by what had just been revealed. Simon, clearly freaking out, exclaimed, "What the heck is that? I never provided any sample. It's got to be fake." I swabbed your mouth while you were sleeping. The result clearly matched you. But hey, if you're doubting it, let's do another test right here, right now. Simon, after being lost for words. Spat out. Why even get a DNA test? You thought so too, right? That Tina was from another man. Just listen for a sec. I said, hitting the play button on my voice recorder. What played next was a conversation between Simon and some other woman. Nelly, once the divorce is final, you and me, we're gonna be together. Really, Simon? Even with your wife having a baby and all, is that cool? Came her reply. I've got a plan. I'm going to make it look like she's the one who cheated. I will pay some random guy for a DNA sample. Once I have the result, I will divorce her and get some cash. Genius, Simon. We'll need that money to start fresh. The silence followed the playback. I can't even. His dad began, visibly shaken, while his mom looked went pale. I spread out some photos for everyone to see. 
shot of Simon and Nelly going into a hotel. As you can see, he's been sneaking around with a co-worker, even while I was pregnant. I had a PI collect all of this. I let out. You knew? Simon cried out. I fixed him with a glare. Of course I knew. The only cheater here is you, jerk. And just when he looked totally lost, my sister-in-law, the athletic type, jumped up and punched him in the face. Seriously, sis? Guess you forgot about my black belt, huh? What the heck were you thinking? Say you are sorry to Janet and to her mom and dad right now. She punched him again, forcing him to apologize, while both our families looked on in shock. Out of breath, he stammered. Janet, I messed up, big time. But I swear I do love you. Please, give me another chance. Taking a moment, I said, who in their right mind would forgive a guy who cheats and then makes such a sick plan? We are done. Just pay up and get out of my life, loser. Please. His parents kept apologizing over and over to me and my folk. My sister-in-law yanked him out of the room, color in hand. After that, our divorce went through, with Simon's bank account taking the biggest hit. We settled on a monthly child support deal. I made sure to send evidence of Simon's affair to his and Nellie's employers. Word got around their company fast, which led to her quitting and Simon getting demoted. He became infamous as the guy who stepped out on his pregnant wife, but he was stuck working there to cover the child support. His family apologized nonstop and said they were cutting ties with him. With his family, his reputation, and his savings all gone, Simon is now slugging it out in his own personal nightmare. And honestly, I couldn't care less. He's getting what he deserves. As for me, I've been living it up, raising Tina near my parents. They've been a huge help with her, and I'm thinking of jumping back into work soon. From here on out, it's all about enjoying the little moments with him and living my best life. My science project title is The Behavior of Cheating Fathers. That's what my son announced during his sixth grade class presentation where my husband and I were attending. When our son's name was called, he confidently walked to the blackboard and pinned up a large poster. The room went silent for a moment then erupted in murmurs. Undeterred, our son began presenting. I chose this topic because on December 10th, right before winter break, I saw my dad walking arm in arm with a woman I didn't recognize. I noticed more suspicious behavior after that, so I decided to research my own dad. From the back of the room, I stared at the poster filled with numerous photos and detailed research findings. I realized it all. My husband's late nights and his distance from our family. He had been cheating. I was seething inside. I wouldn't stand for this. I shot my husband a glare and demanded, What is this about? He looked back, pale and trembling. Stay with me to see how this story unfolds. My name is Emily, a 40-year-old working mom. I've been with the cosmetics company I joined right out of college. I've recently been promoted to a manager position and I'm finding it fulfilling. My husband's name is James. We met 14 years ago through a mutual friend. He's set to inherit his father's business and currently works in sales. Despite his occasional recklessness, He's promising and gentle, drawing me closer over time. After dating for two years, I happily accepted his dreamy proposal. Emily, let's build a happy family together. Aw, uh, James? Once we are married, I'd love to have kids soon. Hopefully a boy as an heir. Always in a rush, aren't you, James? We then began visiting our parents to announce our engagement. 
My rural folks loved James. Then it was time to meet his parents, Samuel, a company CEO, and Barbara, a housewife. Their lavish home was intimidating, making me nervous. Don't be tense, Emily. Barbara comforted. We are delighted to meet you. She serves us tea, and seems like a very sweet lady. When James expressed our intent to marry, they were overjoyed. A family will make you a real man, James. Treat Emily well. Despite his stern appearance, Samuel was kind. I am glad to be joining such a lovely family. I replied, and Barbara warmly agreed. They even supported my decision to continue working post marriage. It's an era where women excel in their careers, Samuel pointed out. On our way home, James said, "It seems my folks really liked you. Your parents are wonderful. Dad is usually strict, but what scares me more is Mom. When she's mad, it's terrifying." I was surprised. Really? We better not upset her then. Don't worry. She seemed fond of you. Following our lavish wedding, we began living in the apartment Samuel gifted us. With James often away due to work, house chores largely fell to me. Juggling my job and housework was challenging, but modern appliances made it manageable. Thankfully, he helped out occasionally, so I wasn't too frustrated. A year after we got married, I discovered I was pregnant. Here in the news, James was ecstatic, jumping for joy. Oh my gosh, Emily! I'm going to be a dad. Thank you. My in-laws were just as thrilled as he was. Take care of yourself, Emily. We'll do whatever we can to help. With teary eyes, my mother-in-law tightly grasped my hands, while behind her, my father-in-law couldn't hide his joyful smile. I genuinely felt grateful to have them as my in-laws. My parents live in the countryside, farming, so I don't see them often. During my pregnancy, Barbara took such good care of me. Thanks to her support, my pregnancy went smoothly, and I gave birth without any issues to a lovely baby boy. Seeing the relief on the faces of my husband and in-laws, I said to Barbara, "Would you like to hold the baby?" Taking the baby. She exclaimed with delight, "Oh, how adorable! Have you already decided on his name, Emily?" We discussed it and decided on Noah. What a beautiful name, little Noah! Nice to meet you. I'm Grandma Barbara. Now let's say hi to Grandpa. At that moment. My husband and I truly felt surrounded by familial bliss. Twelve years have passed since then, and Noah is now in sixth grade. Though he's become a bit distant compared to when he was always following me around, saying "Mom, Mom," he's grown into a kind and intelligent boy. We've maintained a great relationship with my in-laws. They've been understanding of my work commitments, even looking after young Noah on my behalf and frequently checking in with me. They adore him, sometimes spoiling him a bit too much, and he seems to love them in return. However, one thing has changed: my relationship with James. We still live together, occasionally bickering, but generally getting along. However. Over the past year, he has become unusually distant towards both me and Noah. James, having climbed the corporate ladder to become a sales director and potentially the next successor, has been increasingly absent from home, studying and busy with work. He rarely speaks to Noah and usually just drinks and goes to sleep at home. This has been the routine for a while. As our son entered his last winter break in elementary school, I suggested to James, who came home late, 
How about we go on a winter vacation? It would be nice for Noah. James, looking bothered, replied, "I'm swamped with work. I don't have time for that." But you've been like this for a while, and I feel bad for Noah. He's at that age where he doesn't want his parents around, right? Just let him be. He retorted dismissively and quickly went to sleep. I felt both disappointed and lonely with his response. The next day, as Noah helped me with the dishes, I told him, "I'm sorry, Noah. We might not be able to go on a trip this year, but we can visit the museum or something, okay?" "It's okay, Mum. You just focus on your work." He replied nonchalantly. I wondered if James was right about him preferring the company of friends over parents now. But you have your project, right? Let me know if there is anything I can help with. I've already decided on my research project topic. I want to focus on that. I see. Well, I won't bother you then. Good luck with it. Though he still had some childlike traits. I felt proud of how mature he had become. Throughout the winter break, James was busy with work, and I was tied up too. So Noah spent more time at his grandparents. He seemed engrossed in his assignments and research, staying in his room most of the day. However, we made sure to share dinner together every evening and chat. I believe our mother-son relationship remained strong. Occasionally, I noticed him looking at me as if he wanted to say something, but I decided to wait until he was ready to talk. And just like that, winter break came to an end, and after a little while, the last open class session of elementary school approached. I decided to ask my father-in-law to have James take the day off from work so he could join me for the class visitation. James seemed hesitant and a bit annoyed, but upon my urging, he entered the classroom. The main event for the open class was for each student to present the independent research they had conducted during the break. One by one, the kids presented their findings, like observation of plants or their own handmade crafts. As I watched them with a smile and clapped, a thought struck me. Noah had seemed really engrossed in his independent research, but what was he going to present? He confidently stood in front of the chalkboard and pinned a large poster to it. The title of my research is "The Behavior of a Cheating Father." The classroom went silent for a moment, and then suddenly everyone began whispering. Regardless, Noah calmly read out the contents of his poster. First, I'll explain why I chose this topic. On December tenth, just before winter break, I saw my dad walking arm in arm with a woman I didn't recognize. I noticed other suspicious behaviors, so I decided to research my own father. From the back of the classroom, I stared at the poster. It was filled with various photographs and densely written research findings. It all made sense to me then. The reason why my husband has been coming home late and had been so distant was because he had been cheating on me. I was seething. This is unforgivable. I immediately turned to my husband and demanded, "What's this about?" He looked pale and trembling. The teacher quickly interrupted Noah's presentation. And even though he pleaded to continue, the teacher told him he couldn't. From the back, I called out to my son, "Let's go home, Noah. I promise I'll listen to your entire presentation." Mom. With that, we left the classroom under the curious gazes of others. In the parking lot, I sharply told James, who was turning pale and trying to get into the car, "You can walk home." I drove straight to my in-laws' house with my son. What happened, Emily? Why isn't Noah in school? 
Barbara exclaimed, while her husband looked on with a puzzled look. To them I said, Please, take a look at Noah's research. I had him spread out his poster on the table. I hadn't been able to see it from the back of the classroom, but the contents were incredibly detailed. It included sections like Observing my father's day, with notes like Leaves for work at 8.30 a.m., leaves office around 10 a.m. with a new female co-worker. They head to a cafe and flirt, return to the office after lunch, leave again at 1.30 p.m. and go to a hotel, then dinner at a restaurant. There were photos he took himself, even one of his father coming out of the hotel. My in-laws were stunned. Oh my goodness. We should confirm this with James. After they reviewed everything, including sections on identifying woman A, recording my father's weekend activities, differences in my father's behavior at home and with A, and text messages between my father and A, Samuel finally said with a shaky voice, Noah, this is very well done, and that's commendable. Thank you, Grandpa. But, Noah, why didn't you tell your mother about this? Noah, with a quivering voice, responded, I thought it would make Mom sad, but I couldn't stand it. I found online that if I wanted to accuse someone, I needed evidence, so that's why I did this. Tears streamed down his face. Holding him tight, I said, It's okay, Noah. Thank you. I promise I'll protect you. I'm stronger than I might seem. I'm sorry, Mom, but I can't see him as my dad anymore. I nodded, took him home, and made him dinner. Later, when I received a call from Samuel, I headed back to their house. In the living room, James sat with visibly angered Samuel and his mother, who was also as mad. Spread out on the table was Noah's project. Now that we are all here, James, explain this. Samuel said in a low voice, This... This is a misunderstanding of Noah's part. I confronted him. A misunderstanding, you say? Then what about this photo of you entering the hotel? Are you saying that Noah just made this up? That's, uh... Oh, and this lady here, Abigail Walker. She's a new employee in your department at work, huh? I even have screenshots of your chats. I love you, Abby. Can't wait to be with you tomorrow. We're going to get married, Abby. Then you'll be Mrs. CEO. Aw, oh, isn't that sweet? Please, just stop. He finally admitted, defeated. Alright, alright, I admit. I cheated on you. It's pretty obvious when it's laid out like this. I can't believe Noah found out. Holding his head in his hands, he looked up. His father informed him. I heard from your deputy manager. Everyone in the company has known about your affair with the new girl, but they were too scared of your position to say anything. What? Using the company car for your rendezvous during business hours? Unbelievable. You're fired, and so is she. James pointed at himself in disbelief. Even though I'm the next CEO? Who said I'd let you take over? Shame on you, you disgraceful son. Dad! Suddenly, his mother, who had been silent till now, slapped him hard across his face. Ow! Mom, what the hell? You disgrace! Apologize to Emily and Noah right now. We are cutting ties with you. Never show her your face again. She continued to slap him multiple times until her husband intervened. All right, that's enough. True to her reputation, James was most afraid of his mother. With a face flushed from the slaps, he staggered over to me. Emily, I'm sorry. Please, if you forgive me, everything can be fixed. 
please forgive me. With all the strength I had, I shouted back. Are you out of your mind? You didn't just betray me, but also left a scar on Noah's heart. We are getting a divorce. I'll be claiming alimony and child support, so brace yourself, you jerk. Go to hell. Samuel threw James out. Our divorce was finalized smoothly, thanks to the evidence Noah had collected. I demanded alimony and child support from him in a lump sum, which he quickly paid, especially with the pressure from his parents. As promised, his father really fired both James and his mistress. I also claimed compensation from the mistress, but since she had no savings, her parents paid on her behalf and took her back to the countryside. I heard that she and James broke up over the money dispute. James, having lost all his savings, his job, and being disowned by his parents, eventually vanished. Rumor has it, he's now living in a rundown apartment in the neighboring state, taking up odd jobs. I don't feel sorry for him one bit. He got what he deserved. As for me, I'm still living near my in-law's place with Noah. Our relationship with them remains unchanged, and they often spend time with Noah. He has declared that he'll take over his grandfather's company, to which he responded with evident joy. As I move forward, I'm grateful for the unwavering support from my in-laws, and look forward to enjoying every moment of my son's growth.